I'd like to introduce you this morning to Elaine Mills. Elaine Mills is from our Extension Master Gardener class of 2012. Um, she's very active within our program. She serves on our social media committee. She's one of our um, co-coordinators at the Glen Carlin Community, Community Library Garden. And she's also serving um, as a mentor for our mentoring program. And so I would like to turn it over to Elaine. Thank you very much, Leslie. Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to today's presentation on native spring ephemerals. This is being brought to you jointly by our unit of Virginia Cooperative Extension and Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia. This is the first talk in the sustainable landscaping series for 2021. And I'm very excited to, to cover this topic because it's a reminder that the spring season isn't too far away and we'll be seeing some of these beautiful flowers uh, cropping up in natural areas before too long. To give you an overview of today's presentation, first of all, I'll give you a brief definition of what ephemerals are and describe some of their characteristics. I'll uh, introduce you to 15 locally native species. I'll briefly talk about some threats to ephemerals and uh, talk a little bit about garden design with them. Also discuss care of ephemerals. And at the end, I'll be presenting some resources. And as Leslie mentioned, we'll be taking breaks at two points to answer your questions uh, about midway through and then again at the end. So first of all, a definition of ephemeral. You may use this term yourselves when speaking about something that is quickly fading. When we're talking about it in botanical terms, we're referring to a plant with a short life cycle. It's growing only during certain favorable periods. And you may have heard of two types of ephemerals, desert and mud flat ephemerals. Those two are plants that take advantage of uh, water conditions at certain periods. So it, in the case of the desert plants, they'll bloom and uh, be pollinated and then uh, go back to a dormant state. They'll be blooming only when, uh, when there's rainstorms. And in the case of the mudflat um, ephemerals, those are plants that live alongside bodies of water. And when the, uh, the water level retreats somewhat, that will allow them the proper conditions for, for flowering before they go dormant again. In the case of spring ephemerals, they're going to develop their stems and leaves and flowers, all the aerial uh, portions of the plant above ground early in the spring. And then they will quickly bloom and produce seed. And finally, their leaves will actually wither by midsummer, leaving only underground structures such as roots, rhizomes, bulbs, or corms. Uh, I want to point out that these are perennials. That means that these are plants that uh, are going to come back again year after year, but they're just going to complete that uh, reproductive part of their life cycle uh, during a very uh, constricted part of time. So a few characteristics of ephemerals. First of all, they're woodland wildflowers, and you'll see them coming up through the leaf litter uh, on the forest ground level. They uh, grow early in the spring. They'll begin blooming and flowering before the leaf canopy uh, leaves, the, the tree canopy leaves out. Uh, these, uh, these ephemerals are pollinated by early emerging insects. And most of them are going to be our native ground dwelling bees. About 70% of our native bees are ground dwellers. They will emerge and they'll be uh, flying at low levels uh, along the forest floor and will be especially attracted by nodding flowers that are bending down and, and offering pollen and nectar. Uh, another characteristic of many of the if spring ephemerals is their close relationship with ants. And this whole process is referred to as myrmecockery and the plants are referred to as myrmecockerous. And the reason for this is that many of them have special attachments to their seeds. They, they are rich in fats and proteins and they're referred to as eliosomes. 
These structures are very attractive to the ants. They will gather up the seeds and carry them back to the nests. I was excited to find this picture that actually shows them in action. So here they are consuming the eliosomes. They don't eat the seeds themselves, just the attachments. And then the seeds are, are left in their nests and that allows them to, to later germinate. So they are, uh, are being distributed uh, throughout the forest area further away from the adult plants. So this morning, I'm going to be introducing you to 15 spring ephemerals that are native to, to Northern Virginia. Uh, Alexandria is in the geographic region of Virginia referred to as the coastal plain and Arlington straddles the coastal plain and the Piedmont. Now there are a lot of spring ephemerals that are also native to the mountainous regions, but I'm not discussing them because, um, because they are native to this other part of the state. And in addition, some of them are not as uh, readily available should you be interested in, in purchasing them to include in your own gardens. Now, uh, to let you know, um, the plants I'm gonna be talking about are listed in a handout and you should find the link to the handout in the email that was sent to you with the link to this Zoom presentation. I wanted to point out that uh, about five of the, the uh, plants that are listed actually ha have links associated with them. And those links will take you to some fact sheets on our Master Gardener, Gardener website. And I'll be telling you more about those at the end of the presentation. You'll see in the plant list, both common names and the uh, related scientific name, the Latin name. And I'm giving both of those because it's really important to be able to use that, that Latin name to uh, make your plant purchases. That's the way a lot of native plant sellers um, identify their plants. So there's absolutely no confusion about which plant you're, you're purchasing. So let's move on. The first of the plants uh, today is bloodroot, Sanguinaria canadensis, one of the first plants to, to bloom in the spring. This plant is about six to 12 inches high, fairly short, blooms in part to full shade in moist, rich, uh, humus rich, well drained soil. And most of the ephemerals are going to grow in those light and uh, soil conditions. So I won't necessarily be repeating that information unless there's, there's something slightly different. This particular plant tolerates dry soil and uh, black walnut and is deer resistant. And uh, uh, quite a few of these plants are in fact deer resistant. One important thing to note is you'll want to wear gloves when handling the roots to prevent skin irritation. When the a blood root flowers emerge, they'll be enfolded by leaves and they bloom during the period of March to April. As they open up, you'll see that they have about eight to 16 petals and they are very attractive to our native insects. They uh, actually close at night or during cloudy weather. And this, this particular feature allows them to self-pollinate should they not be pollinated by insects. They have palmate leaves like the, uh, like the fingers of a hand and they have a beautiful scallop lobes. And as I've mentioned, because they are ephemeral, those are going to be going dormant in the midsummer. But before that happens, after the flowers are pollinated, they'll form these elongated seed pods. And here are some great photos that show you the interior of a pod and exactly what those seeds look like with those attached eliosomes. They are shallow growing rhizomes and those rhizomes exude a bitter tasting reddish sap. And I'm, I'm mentioning this because that's what makes them less appealing to deer, but they'll also uh, be uh, irritating to the skin. And that's why you would want to wear gloves to handle those. Uh, blood root will form colonies uh, from the rhizomes in shady areas, and it combines well with shade loving plants. Uh, some examples would be ferns, trillium that you can see here, white wood aster, uh, a great uh, ground cover that will actually not be blooming until the fall, Solomon's seal, 
and uh, actually some vines of Virginia creeper here. Our second plant is twin leaf Jeffersonia diphylla, uh, another short plant growing about nine to 18 inches tall in part shade. And this one can actually tolerate heavy shade. This plant is rather delicate. So you're going to want to plant it away from competition and definitely away from wind because of the fragile flowers. Um, another uh, level of protection can be added by uh, introducing mulch uh, in summer and winter. You'll note here that the leaves are actually folded early on as the, the flowers begin to bloom. Now, it appears that it actually is, uh, has a pairs of leaves, but these are really single leaves that are simply uh, deeply divided into two lobes. The flowers themselves uh, are fragile, they're short-lived, and they'll be blooming in April. They produce pollen for bees, but, but like the bloodroot, they can self-pollinate by closing at night. And there's this very interesting fruit that's uh, pear-shaped, and the seeds of that plant, like the bloodroot, will be spread by ants. Twin leaf uh, spreads vegetatively, so you could use it as a seasonal ground cover, but remember that it will be declining by mid to late summer. You can use it in shaded woodland areas and uh, other accompanying plants might be creeping phlox and native violets. Our next plant is the beautiful spring beauty, Claytonia virginica. And this plant is named after the early colonist and uh, botanist, John Clayton. This grows about six to 12 inches tall, and I've actually seen it growing in somewhat uh, sunny conditions. But again, it prefers moist, rich, acidic soil. This plant grows from corms, which are underground storage structures that look a, a little bit like, uh, like, like bulbs or, or tubers. And I was very lucky in that some squirrels must have collected the corms at some point from a woodland area and actually buried them in my yard. And over a period of years, uh, they actually naturalized and spread into, into quite a, a nice uh, display. This, this picture was actually taken in my yard. Spring Beauty has narrow grass-like leaves and these eventually will be fading. Uh, when the flowers come out, they will be blooming in April. And as you can see in this middle photograph, they nod and they'll close up at night and on cloudy days. And this is a way that the flowers can uh, protect the reproductive parts. So um, nectar and, uh, and pollen will, will not be washed away. And as you can see in the right-hand photograph, there's wonderful nectar guides, the, the pink lines that will guide bees to the nectar and pollen in the center of the flower. There are some bees that are, that are referred to as specialists that, that will only use the nectar and pollen of this one particular plant. Spring Beauty, after it's uh, pollinated, will uh, form these seed capsules. And here's a great picture showing you what those corms look like, the ones that the squirrels introduced to my yard. As I mentioned, Spring Beauty naturalizes by uh, bulb offsets and also by self-seeding. And it's really attractive when combined with ferns and uh, other spring wildflowers. Uh, an ephemeral that you may be less familiar with is cut leaf toothwort. It now goes by the scientific name cardamine concatenata. It was formerly identified as dentaria lacinata and that was due to the tooth-like projections uh, that uh, appeared on the rhizomes. So that's where the, the term dentaria came from. It's about six to nine inches tall, fairly short. And uh, one problem for this plant in our woodland areas is that it is frequently displaced by invasive garlic mustard. Both of the plants, the garlic mustard and this plant, the toothwort, are members of the mustard family. And when garlic mustard is present, sometimes the, the chemicals uh, in the leaves of those plants will accidentally attract the particular uh, butterfly that normally would be using 
the, the cutleaf toothwort as a host plant. The uh, female adult butterfly would lay her eggs on that native plant. And when her uh, caterpillar emerged, uh, that caterpillar would get nourishment uh, from the leaves of, of the cutleaf toothwort. But if the butterfly is accidentally attracted to the garlic mustard, when the caterpillars emerge, they will not get the proper nourishment and will die. The leaves of cutleaf toothwort, as you can see, have very sharp tooth segments. That's how they get their name. And they'll appear in a whirl of three leaves. The flowers uh, have four petals in the shape of a cross and those uh, provide nectar for bees. Uh, the, the butterfly that I mentioned that uses this as its larval host is the West Virginia white. Uh, again, this is another uh, ephemeral that naturalizes to form colonies and you can use it in either woodland gardens or shady rock gardens. Our next plant is rue anemone, Thelictrum thelictroides, and it gets its common name because the flowers look like those of anemone and the leaves look like those of meadow rue. This particular plant, uh, despite its uh, fragile appearance, actually tolerates hard spring frosts, drought, and heavy shade. This is another one where you'll want to wear gloves when handling the roots. Rue anemone flowers in April. These look like uh, uh, white petals, but they're actually uh, petal-like sepals. And those can be uh, pink in color with the rosea cultivar. This, the flowers will provide pollen for bees and flowers. And in the center photo, you see the three lobed leaves that uh, resemble the meadow rue. The basal foliage is arranged in whorls. Uh, again, a lovely plant to use in woodland or shady rock gardens, uh, but those will disappear. They will go dormant in the summer. Our next plant that you may be somewhat familiar with is yellow trout lily. Erythronium americanum. It, this is a very delicate short plant, only four to six inches high. Uh, this is another one like the spring beauty that grows from corms. And it gets its name from the mottled leaves, which unfortunately may be tasty to deer. These next photos will give you a, a great reminder of why it's called trout lily because of those mottled leaves. The leaves appear first. Uh, those flowers uh, are nodding. Uh, very attractive to the uh, low flying bees, and those have retroflexed petals in March to May. Yellow trout lily uh, again can form a seasonal ground cover fairly extensive, but uh, and, and the colonies can be quite long lived. They're great to naturalize in woodland gardens, and because they're moisture loving, you can use them beside streams as well as in rock gardens. Our next plant is Dutchman's Breeches, a Dicentra cucularia, another fairly short plant at six to 12 inches. This one likes moist soil, but it's intolerant of wet soil in the wintertime. And it's moderately deer resistant and also resistant to, to rabbits. This one, uh, as well as the, the next Dicentra that I'll be talking about is toxic if ingested. And uh, both of these plants, this one and the, the one coming up, are members of the bleeding heart family. Dutchman's breeches begins with the uh, delicate folded foliage that comes out. And then you'll see that it forms a basal rosette with fern-like foliage. The uh, charming flowers that uh, look somewhat like uh, breeches uh, are waxy and white with uh, yellow lips at the bottom. And you'll see those in March and April. And then they'll form seed pods. They start out a light green and turn a, a darker, almost blue green. And uh, when those uh, capsules burst open, the seeds will be spread by ants. These flowers are pollinated by early emerging bumblebees. They're uh, one of the insects that's strong enough to, to pry apart those lower uh, lips, the yellow uh, parts at the bottom of the blossoms. 
Uh, these are another uh, plant that are best naturalized in wooden, woodland gardens. And here you see them combined with May apple. Of course, both of these will, will go dormant at midsummer. Uh, a related plant is squirrel corn, Dicentra canadensis, the same height, six to 12 inches. Again, the parts uh, of this plant are toxic. You can see uh, why it's a member of the bleeding heart family. The, the flowers look rather heart shaped. Again, it has that beautiful feathery fern like foliage and they're uh, lavender tinged flowers. Uh, this plant offers both nectar and pollen and again, pollinated primarily by queen bumblebees. The seeds of this plant are spread by ants and the tubers underground uh, are sometimes taken up and uh, spread by mice and chipmunks. We'll be taking some questions at this point if there are any, Colleen. Yes, Elaine, uh, oh, the, there was a recent one. Why is squirrel corn called squirrel corn? <laughs> do, you, do you have any, any uh, information on that? Uh, I'm afraid I don't know unless it uh, might be the popularity of of the tubers uh, for collecting by squirrels. One of the um, alternate presentations that I'm going to be mentioning at the end will very likely have some answers to, to that question. So listeners who would like to, to uh, follow that particular presentation can, can get lots more details on these plants. Okay, there was another question about, um, do you think ephemerals and perennials are competitors for your time or, uh, can they peacefully coexist or how would you think about uh, your garden if you had limited time? Uh, I, I, because they're going to bloom in succession, I think they're, they're wonderful uh, co companion plants. What you'll do is you would use the ephemerals the way you would any of, of the bulbs that you might enjoy in your garden, the, uh, the daffodils, the, the uh, tulips, the narcissus, they're, they're, they're going to have their moments of beauty, then they'll fade. Uh, you just remember where they are and then you'll actually plant perennials, the longer lasting plants that will be there throughout most of the growing season. Uh, they'll be there to, to take you on through the rest of the year. But these plants really add a great deal of beauty in the early spring before those other perennial plants are going to come up. So I would suggest using both if possible. Okay. Um, when's the best time to plant corms? I'm going to be talking about that at the end. You really, you could plant them either in the spring or the fall, although if you're planting them in the fall, you're what you're putting in the ground is going to, to be dormant and it's going to look like not much of anything and you might be a little worried about that. So you may want to wait till the, till the spring when you can actually see uh, more of the foliage uh, coming up. And there was a question about resistance to black walnut. Uh, well, one of the plants that, I, that I, I mentioned is resistant to black walnut. I didn't have any other information about that for the other plants. Okie doke. Um, and I know you're going to be talking about resources for buying plants at the end. That's um, correct. There was a question, is native dicentra an ephemeral? Uh, is, if that question refers to dicentra eczemia, which is the wild believing heart. That is actually not an ephemeral. And, and I should have mentioned that uh, I was not introducing that particular plant because it is not an ephemeral. That one blooms a, a little bit later and its foliage will continue on uh, in, in further into the year than the foliage of these particular dicentra. So that one is dicentra eximia wild uh, bleeding heart, and that one is not an ephemeral. The, the two that I mentioned are Dicentra cucularia, and uh, the, that's the Dutchman's breeches, and, uh, the, and the squirrel corn, the other Dicentra. Okay, I think that's good. Thank you, Elaine. Okay, let's move on. Another beautiful uh, spring ephemeral, one that you may be lots more familiar with, uh, it may not even have realized it, it's a native plant, 
uh, Virginia bluebells, Mertensia virginica. This one's a little bit taller. It measures one to two feet in height. And this one actually likes uh, moist to wet soil. You'll, you'll see it growing in floodplains. Here's another example of a plant that tolerates both rabbits and a black walnut. And deer will seldom severely damage it. Bluebells uh, begin with a uh, foliage that's actually got a purplish tinge to it. And it will, as it grows, it will develop these big floppy smooth leaves that take on a green color. The basal foliage emerges quite early. Uh, that will start appearing in March. The flower buds are, are tightly coiled up, as you see, tucked in between the, uh, the leaves. They're, they're multicolored as they emerge, uh, shades of pink and, and purple and blue. When the flowers come out, most of them are this, uh, this blue color, uh, bluish purple color, although some will be pink. And as you can see in the photo on the left, some of them are, are actually white. There is a great deal of color variation, especially if you see a whole colony of them blooming. These plants bloom for a, a fairly long period, for three weeks in April and they're attractive to a wide variety of pollinators, bees, flies, butterflies, moths, and hummingbirds as well. They, uh, when they're pollinated, they're going to form these little nuts with seeds in them, and uh, they'll actually self-seed to, to form fairly dense colonies, but you'll want to remember, as I've, I've mentioned, to interplant with other perennials to fill in the void when these die back. Virginia bluebells combine beautifully with spring bulbs. Um, and you can also use them in uh, woodland uh, gardens, uh, shady rock gardens. So some examples of companion plants might be tulips, narcissus. They look great with hellebores. Uh, this plant here in the front is the native Eastern red columbine. And I think in the back behind the tree, I'm seeing some may apples, although those are also ephemerals. And speaking of May apples, that's our next plant, Podophyllum peltatum. These are also about one to two feet in height. Uh, they like moist soil, but they will tolerate a certain uh, amount of drought. They tend to uh, dislike other plants that are going to want to compete with them. And some important things to point out is that most of the parts of this plant, the leaves, the roots, and the unripe fruit are poisonous. The ripe fruit is edible, but you want to read up very carefully how to, to use that. Uh, it can make a, a nice preserves or, or jelly, but you, you want to understand how to handle that carefully to avoid any toxicity. The uh, leaves are what, are what are going to emerge first, and they appear folded up very tightly in these pleated spirals in April. They uh, are palmately lobed like the, the leaves of the bloodroot, uh, but these have more of a, an umbrella-like appearance. And as you see in the photo on the right, they have a, a mottled surface uh, before they turn a, a more solid green. And they're, they're quite large. They can measure up to 12 inches across. Uh, the sunnier con conditions, the, the smaller the, the leaves will be. Now, a very important thing to point out is that the flowers actually emerge from the axils only of two-leaved plants. You can see the bud emerging there. And then on the right, uh, a very clear example of, of the, the two-leaved plants. They are single nodding waxy flowers and those will attract long-tongued bees in April and May. The pollinated flowers will form fleshy uh, lemon-shaped fruits, and these are very attractive as food for box turtles if you don't get them first. Uh, the plant colonizes to form dense mats, and as you can see, again, it's only the, the two-pronged plants that will have the flowers. You can use these in woodland settings under deciduous trees, but apparently it's not such a good idea under conifers. I think that's due to the fact that they have uh, fairly shallow roots. So you'll want to combine uh, may apple with other filler plants. Uh, an example might be creeping flocks. You could use ferns. Uh, Allegheny spurge, which is a ground cover that uh, is evergreen and, and will last beyond uh, beyond midsummer. 
Um, other examples are Solomon's seal. Our next plant is a Canada anemone. And I wanna mention that there are actually uh, several anemones that are native in Virginia. The reason why I haven't mentioned um, anemone quinquifolia, which uh, wood anemone, which is native here, is that I could not find any native plant sellers uh, for that plant. Uh, the other plant, um, anemone virginiana, the tall thimbleweed is not an ephemeral. So that's the reason that that one is not included. Anyway, Canada anemone, anemone canadensis, uh, grows one to two feet high. It's another one uh, because it's referred to as a, a windflower. You'll want to protect it from the wind. Uh, flowering may decrease as the clumps become somewhat crowded. And I'll talk a little bit about how to divide and, and spread your ephemerals at the end of the presentation. This is another one that has a, a level of toxicity. So you'll want to wear gloves uh, to avoid the toxic sap when you're handling the, the roots and you definitely would not want to ingest this. Uh, it has a basal clump of deeply dissected leaves. And it's another one of those uh, plants that's referred to as a petalus. Uh, it doesn't have petals uh, on its upward facing flowers. As you see with the arrow pointing, uh, what appears to be a petal is actually a sepal. Sepals are the parts of uh, flowers that actually protect them when they're in their bud stage. And sepals are usually green, but in this case, they are, are white. The seed heads are very interesting. They form, and it's a cluster of uh, sheens. Those are, are dried seeds. Um, the one thing to note about this is that this can, can spread fairly aggressively from rhizomes, uh, and it can naturalize in moist areas near streams or ponds. This particular uh, colony of plants uh, was at Meadowlark, and I believe I've spotted a blue wild indigo, which I normally think of as more of a, a sun-loving plant, and also Joe Pieweed there at the back. Our next plant is large flowered bellwort, Uvularia perfoliata. This is a somewhat taller plant at 12 to 18 inches. Uh, I understand that the young shoots can be eaten as a substitute for asparagus, but I wouldn't want to do that because it would uh, deplete the, the flowers. Um, I found conflicting information on the deer resistance of this plant. Some of them listing it as a uh, fairly resistant and others as a plant that would be very attractive to deer. So I think uh, following the, the words of our uh, of our extension agent, uh, Kirsten Conrad, uh, deer won't necessarily uh, avoid plants. They, they could find plants uh, attractive some of the time. Uh, it's very hard to, to find a plant that's going to be uh, completely deer resistant. It's, this particular one is referred to as perfoliate because the stems appear to grow through the leaves. They appear to be piercing the leaves. And the flowers of these have what are referred to as tepals. Those, uh, that's the term that's used when there isn't a clear distinction between the sepals and the petals of the flowers. And if you look at the lower uh, picture, uh, the inset there, they have um, orange granular glands that are inside on the interior. And that's uh, something that makes it uh, attractive to the, to the bees that have come to seek the nectar. The, the fruit of this particular flower is a three angled capsule and you'll see that uh, in June to August. This plant uh, spreads by stolons to form a colony. Stolons are above ground roots. This is one of my favorite plants, uh, probably not as familiar to many of you, Eastern Shooting Star. Uh, when I first acquired it, it was referred to as Dodecathian media, and it now has been reassigned. It's a member of the primrose family, family and it's uh, referred to as primula media. This one grows a 10 to 12 inches tall. Uh, it likes moist, humid, humus rich soil, but it can tolerate clay soil. It's one where you'll want to keep the soil evenly moist, but to avoid wet soil. Uh, in the winter time, fairly deer resistant. 
This one uh, begins growing with a, a basal rosette of leaves. And the second, the middle photo, you're actually looking down at the plant. Uh, that's just to show you uh, what the umbel looks like, uh, how many buds, 18 to 20 buds on this tall leafless stalk. And here's what the flowers look like when they're all in bloom simultaneously, absolutely beautiful with all of those retroflexed petals. Uh, this plant is in bloom in April, and this is uh, pollinated by queen bumblebees. They're one of the bees that's strong enough to, to pry apart the, uh, the reproductive parts of the flower. And they use a process referred to as buzz pollination. They actually vibrate their bodies and, and that shaking movement allows the pollen to, to be released. Uh, they can gather it up and some of it will fall on their bodies as well. Um, as they move and they'll pollinate as they move to other flowers. Uh, the rosettes um, may actually develop some offsets over time to allow it to spread. <clears throat> and it's beautiful what used in woodland gardens and naturalized areas. In the middle photo that was taken in my yard, uh, the purple flowers behind are creeping flocks and over on the side are some hellebores. The photo on the right was taken in a garden section at Meadowlark and you see ferns. I think uh, those are probably ostrich ferns. Uh, they've also combined it with hellebores. There's some hostas and the yellow flowers are celandine poppies. Now, I wanted to mention that this is a plant that is native to Virginia, but when I've spoken to native plant sellers, they've pointed out that it is only native in the mountainous regions of Virginia. Uh, some people like to grow it here, but I was uh, warned that it can become quite aggressive. It is a native plant, not invasive, but it can be quite aggressive. And when I was actually just babysitting some of the poppy plants, not actually uh, planting them in the ground, but just um, babysitting some potted plants that were going to be used at a plant sale, all of a sudden I had them cro uh, cropping up in other parts of my garden before very long. So I've decided not to use that particular plant. This is a not to be confused with the invasive lesser celandine, uh, Ficaria verna. The celandine poppy, the native one from the mountainous area is Styloforum diphyllum. Uh, our next plant uh, may be uh, maybe the quintessential plant we think of with uh, spring ephemerals is great white trillium, Trillium grandiflorum a fairly tall plant at six to 18 inches. It's the largest and the showiest of the trilliums with long lasting flowers. Uh, as with all the trilliums, the plant parts of the leaves and the flowers are in multiples of three. And with these particular flowers, uh, they will actually fade to, to pink as they age over the process of uh, their bloom in April. They're another plant that will spread slowly by rhizomes uh, lovely to use in shady borders and woodland gardens. And I think here uh, at Meadowlark, it was combined with the Rue anemone, the Thelictrum thelictroides that I mentioned earlier. There are uh, quite a few other types of trilliums that you may see in woodland areas. Uh, toad shade is Trillium sessile. That's one where the, the flowers uh, emerge directly uh, from the, the leaf base rather than uh, from a stalk. Yellow trillium, trillium luteum in the middle, and red trillium, trillium erectum on the right. And I want to conclude uh, our quick tour of spring ephemerals with one that grows in moisture conditions uh, rather than so much in a woodland. This is marsh marigold cowslip, Caltha palustris. It grows about eight uh, to 12 inches tall. And this one will actually grow in sun to part shade. And uh, in addition to uh, enjoying humus rich soil, it can actually grow as you see pictured here in standing water. The seeds are dispersed by rain and they have a spongy coat that allows them to, to float. These are deer resistant because of the acidic quality of the foliage. But that also means that if you want to, uh, to plant them yourself, you'll want to wear gloves to avoid skin irritation. 
Uh, you don't want to confuse this with the invasive lesser celandine that I mentioned earlier that has uh, elongated tepals. This uh, plant will first uh, appear in March. It has glossy heart-shaped leaves. And then as it blooms in April, it will offer nectar and pollen for surfid flies and other pollinators. And uh, this particular plant has UV patterns on the sepals as nectar guides. The seeds of Marsha Marigold are enjoyed by birds and chipmunks. And uh, because it's a wetland plant, it will provide shelter for frogs. Uh, I'd like to speak just very briefly about some threats to ephemerals. Uh, the first, which uh, I haven't pictured here, is just the simple threat of, of humans going into uh, wild areas, natural areas, and uh, digging up and collecting the plants. That means that they can't reproduce there and, and they will slowly be dying out. Some other examples uh, are lesser celandine, that's the Ficaria verna that, that is originally from Europe. This uh, plant emerges very early in the spring and is so invasive in its spread that, that it can really outcompete some of our uh, early emerging native ephemerals before they really get a chance. This is certainly happening. I've, I've seen it. There's a, a very heavy uh, infestation of these plants in Bonaire Garden uh, in Arlington. Uh, another problem can be from uh, so-called allelopathic plants. One example is Norway maple. Um, another problematic plant that you may be familiar with is, is black walnut. These uh, particular plants exude a chemical from their roots that makes it difficult for other plants to, to grow uh, in the vicinity. And finally, uh, other plants uh, that can cause a problem are mis the mis ones with misleading chemicals like the, the garlic mustard that will attract um, pollinators uh, away from the native plant to the invasive plant. Uh, just a few quick notes. I I've hinted at this uh, as we've gone along. A few quick notes on garden design with spring ephemerals. Uh, you'll want to combine these in naturalistic in, in informal groups. In other words, you want to plant them en masse the way you would handle any of the bulbs like, like tulips um, or, or narcissus and any of the uh, non-native bulbs. It's really not particularly attractive when you have them all lined up rigidly in a row. You can, you can maybe uh, throw them, scatter them, and then just plant them wherever they've landed to create a, a very natural look. Um, as, as we discussed in, in the question uh, and answer period earlier, it's perfect to combine them with perennials, actually, as you can see in this photo here, tucked under some shrubs. And you'll want to actually plan for a succession of bloom. These are going to be blooming earlier, but then the foliage will be dying back. So it's great to have them interplanted with perennials that will be coming along in the spring and summer and actually uh, lasting and blooming into the fall as the ephemerals fade. Uh, some notes on caring for ephemerals. Uh, in a presentation I attended recently from a gentleman who actually collects the, the seeds of many of these uh, ephemerals for uh, being able to, to offer through his, his native plant service. He indicated that it can be quite difficult to grow these from seed. Uh, and in fact, seeds of these plants are fairly expensive. And the reason for that is that the plants are small. It's uh, challenging to collect from them. Some of the seeds will actually have low viability and they require some special conditions for storage. And uh, they need to, some of them go through a process referred to as stratification, actually storage in cold uh, before they will, will germinate. When the, the seedlings grow, they will actually take quite a while to mature and some of them can actually take as much as three to seven years before they're flowering. So you may actually want to, to buy them as young plants from native plant sellers. If you bring them into your garden, uh, as I mentioned, they're best planted either in the spring or the fall, not in, in the hot weather. But uh, as I said, you'll, they'll be in their dormant state if you buy them in the fall. 
you want to site them as we've discussed throughout in rich, well-drained acidic soil. These are the conditions uh, in the natural settings of the forest. And you also want to find a location where they'll begin receiving some late winter sun, but then they'll be shaded a bit later on. Uh, you want to mimic those uh, forest conditions where the canopy would eventually be filling in. That means that you don't want to plant them on the north side of the building because they won't be getting sun, nor would you want to plant them under evergreens because they would be totally shaded through their en entire life cycle. You would plant the roof stock, uh, root stock or the corms about two to three inches deep. And as I've mentioned with many of them, you'll want to handle them carefully, both because they're, they're delicate and you'd want to wear gloves to protect your hands from any toxicity. Uh, the corms and the roots can withstand the drought of summer when they become dormant, but you'll want to be sure that they get enough moisture during the, uh, the fall. That's when they're going to be expanding their root growth. And of course, you'll want to mulch them with finely shredded leaves to, to parallel the conditions that they would be going through uh, in the forest. If you're interested in uh, propagating them, older plants can be divided when they've gone dormant after the leaves have faded. The picture here is showing an upside down uh, plant. It's the, uh, the spring beauty plant, uh, the Claytonia that I mentioned, Claytonia virginica. And you can see the corm there at the top and then uh, the roots and then the, the stems and the flowers. You would actually be taking it up to divide after, uh, after the flowers had faded, but this is just an example to show you what the corms look like. You would want to gently dig up and divide uh, the, the rhizomes, the tubers, the corms, whatever the, the underground storage form of the plant is, and then replant them. And you'll be, as you do that, you'll be cutting them in pieces. So you'll have a part with roots and part with, uh, with the stem growth. And you, uh, in the case of any, any bulbs, you'll, you can actually just uh, break off offsets in order to replant those. And it's a good idea to use markers to help you locate where the plants are after dieback. That way you'll know where to, to place your other perennial plants. If you're interested in seeing spring ephemerals, uh, I photograph them in many different locations and I'll, I'll tell you about those. Two uh, local gardens to check out would be uh, two of our master gardener demonstration gardens. Uh, the one on the left is the Shade Garden uh, located at Bonaire Park and Glen Carlin Library Garden where I'm one of the coordinators in central Arlington is another great location. I took uh, many of my photos at uh, Meadowlark Botanic Gardens. Uh, you'll find the, these particular plants in the section that's referred to as the Potomac Valley native plant section. There's a, an actual trail that takes you down a hillside through the woods and that's where, where you'll see these plants. At the US National Arboretum in Washington DC, you'll want to check out Fern Valley. Uh, if you go to Turkey Run Park, and walk down through the forest, you'll actually come out onto a floodplain, as you can see in the picture right there along the Potomac River. This is a, a beautiful uh, spread of Virginia bluebells. And uh, the sign there shows you that you can walk along this, uh, these particular trails and perfect location for seeing these plants in, in March and April and maybe early May. Green Spring Gardens um, near Alexandria, Virginia, uh, is a great location in the forested area. The Nature Conservancy has a little pocket garden behind their headquarters in Arlington, and you can see some of the flowers there. And some of our nature centers, such as uh, Long Branch Nature Center in Arlington, another great location in the forest. Uh, as far as acquiring spring ephemerals, I want to reiterate, please do not harvest any wild plants from the forest themselves. If you go to the Plant Nova Natives website, they have a section referred to as native only sellers. And there you will find some reputable native uh, plant nurseries. I myself have purchased plants 
uh, from Nature by Design, which is one of our uh, local plant sellers in Northern Virginia. When I looked at the website for Watermark Woods, I have not shopped there, but a great number of the plants that I have discussed today seem to be available from their plant list. Um, the Virginia Native Plant Society and Earth Sangha locally are fabulous uh, local sources. I, I don't believe Earth Sangha specializes in these uh, spring ephemerals. They have more of the other ephemerals but you might want to check with, with a Virginia plant, a native plant society. And there are also some further um, other nurseries further afield, one of them Hill House and the other Seven Bends. So two other great uh, sellers to check out. For more information, uh, you may want to check out two uh, videos on on native plants. This one is actually on the website of Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia, mgnv.org. You would look under the public education tab for the Master Gardener virtual classroom. This is a wonderful tour by uh, our Arlington County naturalist, Alonso Abugatas. And you'll hear wonderful stories, um, historical uses of the plants by uh, Native Americans, and also some mythical references to the plants. Now, normally he leads a wildlife talks, uh, especially um, in that uh, Turkey Run area for master gardeners. But this past year when that was not available, he did a virtual wildflower talk. So that was recorded and anyone other than, in addition to master gardeners is welcome to to view his presentation. It also includes links to his Capital Naturalist blog posts. And uh, the, the other wonderful video was done by Marion Loebstein, uh, a big name in uh, with the Virginia Native Plant Society. She discusses 100 different species of wildflowers, not just the ephemerals, but other wildflowers, and discusses historical, medicinal, and edible uses. And there is also on this Virginia Native Plant Society site uh, a link to her, the species she discusses. Uh, before we go on to questions, I just wanted to describe the services that Master Gardeners can provide. Uh, I happen to belong to the Arlington Alexandria unit of Virginia Cooperative Extension. This is the organization that provides master gardeners their training. And our particular unit has providing, been pro uh, providing public education uh, on science-based practices for gardening since 1985. And we do this in a number of ways. Uh, as Leslie mentioned uh, before we began recording, we have a help desk which uh, can help you virtually these days. And you would do that by addressing your gardening questions to this particular address, MG for Master Gardener, ARL for Arlington, ALEX for Alexandria at gmail.com. Uh, normally we would have in-person plant clinics at various farmers markets and the Arlington Central Library. These aren't functioning right now, but as soon as we can resume in-person contact, those, those would be active again. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a number of demonstration gardens. I mentioned two of them, the Shade Garden and uh, Gled Carlin. In addition, we have another garden at Bonaire Park, uh, the Sunny Garden, a garden in Alexandria, Simpson Garden, as well as a wonderful organic vegetable garden at Potomac Overlook. And of course, we have classes just like this one. Now, our particular unit of VCE is supported by a nonprofit uh, group referred to as Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia. And uh, we have a website, mgnv.org. And the plants that you uh, see listed on, on your plant lists, the ones that have the links will take you to these fact sheets. You'll get a lot more details on these plants, all the conditions of uh, how they grow and particular uh, growing and maintenance tips. In, uh, and you can find those listed in the, uh, the portion of the website referred to as tried and true native plants. If you want to find the recording for this class, today's class, 
or any other classes that we have done uh, starting last year in April, you'll go to this website, mgnv.org, and look for the public education tab. You can arrow down to Master Gardener Virtual Classroom, and we have our classes grouped in three different uh, sections, best management practices, urban agriculture, and this particular class you'll find along with others that uh, I've given along with my colleagues on sustainable landscaping. And finally, we have uh, several aspects of social media. I personally do weekly uh, Facebook posts um, and daily Instagram and Twitter posts. So you can follow us there for information as well on native plants. Any more questions, Colleen? Uh, yes, there are more questions. Uh, there were actually a lot about caring for the plants and you covered a lot of it in the second half of the presentation, but there are a few more. Uh, one was, do ephemerals need to be fertilized? Uh, my understanding with, with native plants is you, you really don't need to do the, the fertilizing of them with, with, a, with, a, with a chemical fertilizer. If you are planting them in the conditions that I've described, that, uh, that moist, humus rich soil, and if you are allowing them to, to grow through the, uh, the shredded forest leaves, those are the conditions that provide all the nutrients that they need in, uh, in, in nature. And if you can reproduce those conditions, that, that's going to be uh, satisfactory for them. Okay, great. Could you define a uh, retroflex and is it different from reflexed? Uh, I, I think those have a similar meaning. The retroflex just, it, it means that they're bending, they're bending back. They're, they're curved back away from, uh, from the central section. Okay, I think that's a good answer. Are queen bumblebees a separate species or just the female or the queen of a bumblebee group? Yes, they are, they are the female. They're the, the, the member of that, of that group that is going to be uh, reproducing and, uh, and creating all the, all the, the larva, the, the, the bees that will eventually grow up into the, into the other members of that bee colony. So the queens are the ones that are going to come, come out early. They're going to, to come uh, looking for both pollen and nectar. They're the ones that use that buzz pollination technique that I described. So they'll, they'll uh, use the nectar themselves, then they'll be collecting the pollen and bringing that back as, as nourishment for the young. Okay. Um... Can you just briefly go over again, which, um, which ephemerals do best in moist soil? Uh, really, all of them are going to do, are going to prefer moist soil. The ones that, um, that I mentioned that can actually take a, a wetter soil, uh, the trout lilies, um, certainly the, uh, the Virginia bluebells, because those are, are plants that grow uh, in the floodplain. I, I believe um, in his talk, um, the talk by Alonzo Abugadis, where he's discussing the cut leaf toothwort, he describes that as a plant that actually um, some species would be carried down by, by rivers from, from, from the Piedmont, the more mountainous areas. So those are, are plants that would also grow in, in the floodplain, and then certainly uh, the marsh marigold. That's the one that actually can grow in standing water. Okay, great. Um, Elaine, there were a lot of um, questions about um, invasive species crowding out ephemerals, but there was also someone who talked a little bit of, about her perennials, specifically wood asters growing into her blood root. Is that a problem, do you think? Well, white wood aster is, is a fairly aggressive spreader. Um, I personally find it easy enough to, you know, to pull up sections of it and make sure that, that it's not in, encroaching on, on other plants in, in my garden. But uh, yes, it's true. I mean, some of our, some of our native plants, the, the other perennials can, can spread uh, rather vigorously. 
I think you may have already gone over this, but there was a question again about when is the best time to transplant ephemerals? Okay, uh, you wouldn't want to be doing it during the summer. That's, that's when they're dormant and they, they really need to be resting. And I don't believe that, that the plant sellers would be, would be offering them, especially at that time. They may offer them in the fall and the weather would certainly be cool enough to plant them then, but, th but they're going to be dormant. So you're going to feel as though you're just planting a, a ball of, of dirt, you know, a little, a little pot full of, of soil if you were to, to get a, a, a seedling uh, and plant it in the fall. If you get it uh, early in the spring, when, and, and these plant sellers are going, to, is, are going to start selling plants you know, fairly soon. If you get them then, then you'll be able to see exactly uh, what the foliage is beginning to look like as it's, as it's emerging from, from that root stock. But e either season should work. Okay. Um, if you had a nine-year-old who was interested in starting to grow ephemerals, is there one you would recommend? Ah, uh, let's see. I would, I would maybe steer clear of the ones that I've mentioned that, that have the, the more toxic root stocks, uh, root stock, something like the, like the blood root, for example, where you need to be a little a bit concerned about the sap. Um, I think may, may apple is one that, that's pretty easy to grow. Of course, you may not see those pretty flowers. Sometimes it takes a while for your plants to, to grow mature enough to have those, those uh, two-pronged leaves, so you may not see the flowers right away. A spring beauty is pretty delicate, so that might be a little, a little more challenging. What um, about the Virginia bluebells? I think the bluebells might be a might be a really easy one to do. That I think that may have actually been the first first uh, ephemeral that I ever introduced to my garden. So good suggestion, Colleen. I think that's well, a great um, example. Yeah, they okay, great. Um, there was a question about whether uh, squirrel corn is deer resistant. Uh, I can't remember what I've listed there uh, earlier on. Uh, I tried to indicate if, if I had any knowledge of, of whether they were, I, I tried to indicate that um, already. And I, I'm sorry, I can't remember what I okay. said, but I, I will try to look further in that if, if I can find, if I didn't list that uh, on that first slide, I'll try to uh, provide that information. I always uh, look back through the, through the chat questions to see if there's any further information I can provide. And I will send out uh, an addendum uh, I'll have uh, Tyler, my Master Gardener colleague, who sent you the link uh, uh -huh. to this Zoom session. I'll have him send that out. And then, and then that addendum would also be posted on the website when this recording is captioned and, and posted. Okay, Elaine, I think that does it with the questions. There were many, many, many comments about how wonderful this presentation was. And I noticed there was even someone from as far away as Colorado. So you're getting a pretty wide audience these days. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome, welcome everyone. Of course, some of the plants I've been talking about today, I've been discussing uh, ephemerals that are native in my particular region. Uh, as you'll see on the on the fact sheets, they will also be native throughout uh, further sections of of the Mid Atlantic, but. If you're from another region, they may or not may or may not be native to your region, but you can certainly contact your local extension office, or another great source would be a native plant society uh, from your state, uh, from your region, and inquire about native uh, ephemerals for your particular section of the country. But a lot of the principles I've discussed as far as the conditions they would grow in the way to plant them in your landscapes, uh, the way to care for them would, would be applicable. So thank you everyone so much and uh, good luck viewing these plants and good luck adding them if you would like to in your own personal gardens.